I love this place. I, I don't know how many of you get a chance to come here when you're waiting for a sandwich or you've been in here before, but uh, this is like a refuge uh, for me. Uh, the outside world the last little while hasn't been so friendly. Things are, are pretty tough outside, and especially in my business because I sort of specialize in bad things. I specialize in pandemics and nuclear weapons and climate change and water and war and things like that, uh, which is a growth industry these days. <laughs> I'm gonna try to tell you a story about compassion woven through my crazy life and uh, try to, as often as I can, focus a little bit on the stuff that the image flow is all about, images flowing. So f first of all, uh, I'm gonna say that this is a very hard time to be compassionate. Um, we have a new president who seems to specialize in provoking hatred. And I've been trained by masters in compassion and still I really have a very hard time. And, um, and when I was 18 and I was a student at the University of Michigan and I saw a little ad that Martin Luther King was coming on campus. And I don't know what got me out of my seat out of my bed to go, because uh, Martin Luther King wasn't yet famous, or that famous, he hadn't won his Nobel Prize. And we hadn't had the Mississippi summer yet. But I went, and an auditorium that could have seated 4,000, there were only maybe a couple hundred of us. And uh, Martin Luther King got up there and looked around, and the, the president of the university who introduced him was very embarrassed that there were so few people. And Dr. King looked up and said, ah, There'll be more of me to go around. You all come on up on stage. And about half of us went up on the parquet floor there, and the other half stayed in front of him, and we stayed with him for six hours. And I had never heard anybody talk about compassion and love as he did. And that was just what I needed to hear. I needed to hear that the world would ultimately be a good place, and that all the fears we had about the Vietnam War, all the fears we had about um, the violence in the civil rights movement, all the fears we had that, that they would go away and it would be a good world again. And maybe more importantly, that if I jumped out of my chair and I leaped up, there was something for me to do. Because that's what we need when we're feeling hopeless and lost. Um, and then, you know, I carried on like many of the people of that era as part of my career path. Um, I became a radical and a radical doctor. And I, I did my internship at what was called Presbyterian Hospital in San Francisco. It's now Pacific Medical Center. And the day that I got there, which was the 1st of July, I saw this, which is the cover of the, what was then the Time Magazine of Medicine. And uh, the story was uh, warning all the real doctors in the United States that the young radical doctors were gonna take over. And we were radical because we believed that health care was a right and not a privilege. Mm. And uh, the day I got to uh, Presbyterian Hospital, this image had been reproduced a couple hundred times and put on all the nurses' bulletin boards and all over Presbyterian Hospital, except they had added one thing, which was a bullseye around my nose <laughs> and a hypodermic needle in the bullseye. And it said, Presbyterian Hospital welcomes its young radical doctor, Dr. Brilliant. Um, at the end of my internship, uh, a group of Native Americans took over Alcatraz. And a woman on that island, Lou Trudell, was pregnant, and she wanted to give birth to her baby on Indian liberated land. How many of you remember that? How many of you were here? You see, it, it was a thing. And uh, Herb Cain wrote every day in the newspaper, there's no water, there's no medicine, there's no food, there's no electricity on the island, it's dangerous for her to give birth to her baby and the Coast Guard are gonna medevac her unless a doctor is willing to go out there, live on the island. And I thought that was like a little ad that said, Larry, come on out on Alcatraz. And <laughs> so of course I went out there and uh, I assisted in uh, the delivery of a baby named Wavoka. And I've told that story about uh, Alcatraz all the time we lived in India and when I wound up working for the United Nations and nobody believed me they didn't think I was there. Uh, two years ago, Girij and I were in Tiburon and we were watching a, a movie festival, a movie of Alcatraz, and that movie came on and I saw me <laughs> on Alcatraz and I finally had proof. Um, which, as you get older, it's nice to have the image that 
you know, because you, you're never 100% sure. Um, when, when I joined uh, this movie caravan, uh, we met um, uh, a bunch of wonderful people. This was supposed to be a movie about the Grateful Dead, the Jefferson Airplane, Jethro Tull, Pink Floyd going across country. The Jefferson Airplane didn't show up for the movie, but we still did the caravan, and uh, sort of the leaders of the caravan were Wavy Gravy and the Hog Farm. The first day, uh, my job was to vaccinate all of the cast against smallpox, which I had never heard of or seen. I mean, I read about it in medical school, but I didn't know. And the reason that I had to vaccinate everybody was because we were going to come back from uh, doing a final concert in, in England. And to get back in, you had to have a little yellow card that said you were vaccinated. So the, one of the first people that I vaccinated was this guy. Yeah. And, um, you know, I knew that I was meeting somebody uh, unlike anybody I ever met before. <laughs> and if I had any doubt, he was wearing a duck bill hat with a real duck's real bill. And when he smiled, you could see that he, his teeth were a real rainbow because he'd persuaded a dentist to put crowns in that were Vibgior, violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow. And Wavy became my best friend, and my wife and I ran away with the circus. Those are our pictures from the Hog Farm Family book. Uh, you can imagine when I walked into the United Nations and said I'm supposed to work for you that I was kicked out, but I was. And then this is a picture of us that I had never seen until somebody wrote a book uh, about their trips to Afghanistan uh, and they must, have thought, they must have passed them. But that's our bus, one of our buses, and uh, that's me in Girja and I'm smoking something, which is now illegal in Afghanistan, but legal here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Giraj and I were on this bus with 40 other kids on two buses, and we lived, in, we lived in Turkey and Iran, Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, India, Nepal. We walked, we left the bus, we walked up to just before Mustang and came back down, and then Giraj found um, this wonderful guru named Neem Karoli Baba, who was Ramdas's guru, and she insisted that we go and stay with him. And we lived here for about a year. And uh, this is sort of what it was like in the ashram, uh, being around Maharaji. And that is my wife, that's Guru, that's Giracha. she's back there now. She looks exactly like that now. <laughs> And that's me, and that's all of our friends who were there at that time. Uh, and this is the moment that Maharaji seemed to love everybody in the world, and I kind of wigged out. One day Maharaji called me and said, Dr. America, that's what he called me, I, that was the name he gave me. And he said, Dr. America, how much money do you have, Dr. America? And I said, I have $500. He said, lying, you're lying, you're lying, you're lying, you're lying. How much do you have back in America? I said, I have $500 back in America, too. And then he started to chant. And he said, $500 here, $500 there. You are no doctor. You are no doctor, which is what my mother used to say to me. If all you have is $500, you are clearly not a real doctor. I didn't send you to medical school just to have $500. And he started chanting, you are no doctor, you are no doctor, you are no doctor, you and no doctor. United Nations Organization Doctor, Dr. America is going to become United Nations Doctor. You're going to leave the ashram. You're going to go down to the World Health Organization. You're going to go to villages and give vaccinations. And you're going to help eradicate smallpox because this terrible disease has been killing our children. And God is going to lift this one form of suffering from the backs of humanity. So Giraj and I, I mean, he's your guru, right? Uh, Giraj and I got on a, a taxi and a bus and a train and went 15 hours to New Delhi. And I walked into the WHO office. Um, everybody was wearing a suit and tie. I was still wearing my ashram clothes. And I, Mrs. Boyer, Mrs. Edna Boyer, who was at the front desk, said, what are you here? What do you want? And I said, oh, um, my guru who lives in the Himalayas said, I'm supposed to work for you because God is going to eradicate smallpox. I'm a doctor. 
<laughs> and uh, of course, they kicked me out. Uh, and we went back up the 15 hours back to uh, the foothills and back to the ashram. And Maharaji said, did you get your job? And I said, no, Maharaji. This, he said, go back. And I think on the 15th time that we had made this trip, um, we walked into the office of the World Health Organization, and there was a, another American, the first American that I'd ever seen in the offices there. And he was about six foot three, and he looked like a football coach. And he said, uh, uh, who are you? I said, oh, I'm Larry Brilliant. I live in the Himalayas. My guru said that smallpox was going to be eradicated, and I was supposed to play a role in it. Who are you? He said, my name is D.A. Henderson. I'm the head of the smallpox program. I've come here from Geneva, where the program is located. We don't have a program in India. I'm afraid it's going to be the last place on earth with smallpox. Mrs. Gandhi doesn't want us to have a smallpox program because she has so many other priorities, which made sense to me. He said, but you're here. Maybe I can take you into the cafeteria. I'm waiting for my appointment, and I'll interview you. And then maybe someday that'll change. So he interviewed me. And 10 years later, when I had started as a secretary at WHO, they had to create a job low enough for me. And then I'd worked my way up to managing a village and a, a district. And ultimately, I was part time, sometimes running the whole program of 150,000 people. Um, we had eradicated smallpox. And this is my transformation from a hippie to a, a straight UN diplomat. It, it happened really quickly. Um, and, and how we got rid of smallpox, I'll just tell you quickly. But we would go around to every house and search for hidden cases and then put a, a wall or a ring of immunity around them by vaccinating everybody who had come in contact with them or who lived within a three-mile radius. And we used a recognition card, a card, a photo, another photo. By the way, this was the most reproduced photo in human history until Stuart Brandt said, why haven't we seen a picture of the Earth from space? We printed more than 4 billion copies of this card and took it around to find cases of smallpox, another photographic issue. And that's Giriji right behind me. And that's a Czech doctor, Dr. Janot. And we went house to house. We had 150,000 people. We visited all 560,000 villages, house to house, every month for 20 months. We made 2 billion house calls. Mm -hmm. and, and then we eradicated smallpox. So this is um, a picture of smallpox. I apologize. There's going to be two of these. And I, I know it's hard. But I'd rather you see it because as bad as it makes you feel, it should make you feel really wonderful that it doesn't exist anymore, that there are no more cases of this disease. Because I'm trying to make a, a proof point. I'm going to tell you that there were doctors from 170 countries and that we were Jews and Muslims and Christians and Buddhists and we were Shinto and every religion in the world. And the faces of my team look like a rainbow. And we worked together to eradicate a disease. And we didn't hate each other. And even Russians and Americans, who had 40,000 nuclear weapons pointed at each other, we buried 40,000 hatchets, and we became friends. And instead of fighting each other, we fought together against this disease. And that's why it's gone now. It couldn't have been done without that peacetime army. It couldn't have been done without the United Nations and the World Health Organization. And it certainly couldn't have been done without goodwill and the phenomenal leadership of Nicole and Steno, Yezhik, and these wonderful people, Bill Fagey. Um, that child lived. This is not a bad case of smallpox. Smallpox killed one out of three. We would call this classical smallpox. I'm going to show you a picture of a child who died, and I'm sorry about that. But 
this child died of smallpox. And this child has a mild case of smallpox. There were times that we had to quarantine cities and close the train stations, and I'm not going to tell you all those stories right now, but um, this was a war. And it, it was the largest peacetime army ever assembled until the polio eradication program. And this is the certificate that was signed by uh, 200 health ministers representing their countries and uh, all of the specialized teams that went searching for smallpox to tell the world we had eradicated it and you could give up vaccinating your children safely and you give up those little yellow cards. But think about that certificate and what it means and the effort and the time and the love that went into that and how when any of our leaders tell us that we have to go to our corners and, and just be Christians or just be Jews or just be Muslims, just be Mexicans, that we have to go in our silos and we can't work together, they're wrong. They're just wrong. We can do great things. Uh, this is, um, I think, one of the most important photos in my life. This is a picture of Rahima Banu. And this little girl was the last case of smallpox on earth, the last case of variola major. And I had been carrying these balloons around with me for years. I bought, I bought them uh, in uh, San Jose. Uh, I was just carrying it. It says smallpox can be stopped, and on the back it says it in Hindi. I gave her this balloon and, and took a picture of her. And, you know, for me, I had to think that when the scabs, when her scabs fell off, and she coughed, and she was recovering from smallpox. And when those scabs fell on the ground in Bangladesh and Bola Island, and the sun baked them and killed the viruses, that was the end of a chain of transmission of this evil disease that went back to the pharaohs 10,000 years at least. I used to have a slide. I didn't have it today. But it's the names of 25 kings and queens and emperors who died from smallpox. And that's my favorite slide in public health. It is not my favorite slide because I'm an anti-royalist or anything like that. But it reminds me, and all of my friends, because I'm a creature of Silicon Valley, I couldn't live in Mill Valley if I hadn't worked for Google and started a bunch of tech companies. Um, but it's, it's my reminder to my friends who are new Medicis, victims of sudden wealth syndrome. It's my reminder to them that no amount of wealth and no amount of power can protect you from a new virus that is killing people for which there's no antiviral or no vaccine yet. And uh, this is a picture that I took of this beautiful woman who has been my wife for all these years. We love this picture because uh, we were new in India. Maybe we'd been there for a matter of weeks and we didn't quite understand the sari thing. So uh, she'd gone out to a, a shop and bought a, um, a curtain, a drapery. And that's what she's wearing here. <laughs> and it's always a good thing to remember when you're in a country you haven't been in very long, that things may be different than you think. Thank you very much.